So um, I can't do, use an ATV, but can I use a jet ski? I have no idea. And all that an attorney would have to do is show one time that you paid a claim for someone jet skiing, and that happened to be the GM's daughter, because they're the ones who can afford jet skis. But the woman who's cleaning the hotel on the weekend, her kid was on a, you know, on a moped, and you deny his claim. How do you justify those two? Happens every single day here in our industry. We've got to stop doing that, and there's a big case called MetLife v. Glenn that says you can't do that. So we're going to get into that in a second. Subrogation. Everyone knows this is basically where I started. I, I learned subrogation at a very young age. I worked for uh, an attorney who specialized in subrogation law when I was in high school, and that's where I, I learned about subro. And one thing I've noticed is typically when a plan loses on a subrogation situation, or when I have a TPA talks to me on the phone, hey Adam, you know, my current vendor or our internal office, our internal people, you know, we were only able to get 25% on the, you know, 25 cents on the dollar. Can you get us more? No, why? Because your plan language is horrible. What do you want me to do? It all ties back to your plan. The main thing that we have as an industry that's an advantage over everyone else is the fact that we have the protection of ERISA. We have the rights of being a self-funded employee benefit plan under the terms of ERISA. We're not subject to most state mandates and we have the right to design and implement our own plan doc with innovative language and some really cool cost saving techniques. And we do none of those things. And what we need to start doing is finding and realizing that one thing, your plan doc folks is your contract. When I see that TPAs require their members sign a separate subrogation agreement, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what they're thinking. You already have a contract that's subject to federal law. Having them sign a separate signed subrogation agreement puts them under state law. It takes you out of federal court, puts you into state court. Why? Because you're making them sign a separate agreement that, has not, that is not part of your plan document or your claims experience. It is a breach of contract claim if they breach that contract. Where do you file breach of contract actions? State court. In state court, you have to deal with the main whole rule, common fund rule, common fund rule. You don't have to deal with those in this particular circuit because the fifth circuit is one of the best circuits in the country when it comes to subrogation rights. But why do you do it? I always wonder this, why do we do it? We do it because the stop loss world wanted us to. Why? The stop loss world wanted us to 20 years ago, 15 years ago, because it was delaying the, the, delay the time they have to reimburse you on claims. Really simple. I'm not putting down stop loss. I love stop loss carriers, MGUs. They're great. Probably the most innovative part of our industry are the MGUs and stop loss carriers. No question about it. Most of the great ideas I get are from those people. But I can tell you the problem, that, and they don't require them anymore. It used to be 80% of our industry required signed subrogation agreements. Now it's less than 10%. What do you do instead? You have great plain language that specifically says what your subrogation rights are, what, the right, uh, what are the reimbursement rights are, and what you're saying is when you pay claims, you're advancing payment of the claim. It's advanced funding. It's almost a loan. You're saying we don't have to pay because there's a third party responsible for the claims, but out of the goodness of our hearts, we're going to pay these claims, but you have to agree to do the following. And folks, I can tell you that this works for one reason. The 11th Circuit in this country is the worst circuit in the country for subrogation rights. It always has been, it always will be, until last week. Last week, a big subrogation case came out of the 11th Circuit that gave the plan 100% of their money back based on the fact that their plan language was good. And what the judge said, the appellate court judge in the 11th Circuit said, was this. He said, the plan is the general assets. It's a pooling of all the funds for all these different members in the employee benefit plan. All 400 people of that plan. Allowing this one person here to get all their money back and not have to reimburse the plan and benefit the, all, the whole entire pool is not equitable. So whereas in the past, the thinking always was, it's not fair or equitable to this person to make this person pay the plan back when they're injured. The, the courts have reversed their thinking based on the plan language and based on the Sereboff case and a few other cases, and they're saying, no, 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 no. Sure, it might not be fair to him, but what's not more fair is the fact that all these people now don't have that $300,000 that can be used for future medical claims to keep the price of healthcare down. The court even said that subrogation 
allows plans to offer affordable and health insurance to the employees, and then without subrogation, costs would increase 2%, and maybe a plan wouldn't be able to afford to offer health insurance coverage to their employees. Big case. And if you go on my blog, you can read, I don't know, the, I wish I could remember the case site, I can't, I apologize, but it's on my, it's on my blog, which I'll mention later on. So, in, in addition, what you want to do, you want to make sure the plan member has obligations. This is mostly stuff for catastrophic claims when we talk about what's catastrophic, but these are really innovative ideas you need to, you need to put in, your, in place, and I'll, uh, based on time, I can get back into it. Also, what you want to do is, in your COB provision, talk about having a right of recovery. Not a right, not a right of recovery for subrogation, but a right of recovery for overpayments. Let's face it, everyone makes them. It's okay. You're not the only one. Everyone else in the room has made an overpayment too. But you have to have a right to recover those funds. Folks, bail is back. I, everyone looked up at me, I love it. I got everyone's attention. No one's on their phones anymore. I say bail and everyone looks up. But bail is back, folks. And now they're not just in Texas. They're in my area now. They're coming after TPAs in New England now. Five years after the claim was paid, they say the claim was paid one day too late. Same law firm. They're back. So what I'm telling you is why are they back? Because the lawyers they represent and the firm they work for all sit in the room and they go, we need to make more money. How do we make more money? Let's go after the one industry that we know we can kick in the butt and they'll keep on paying us. They're all over it. They're all over it. So what I'm telling you to do, if you want to make a change, is you've got to put word in your plan docs that won't allow bailers to do what they're doing. And one of those things is a right of recovery provision. One of those things is defining what a clean claim is. To move on to something else. Several square, what this means. This is a little part of what's happening in our industry that's starting to scare me a little bit. There's an argument out there that uh, stop loss carriers are making, and it's being made by a few of the big ones, where they're saying when they reimburse a claim to the plan, when they reimburse the plan on the bill that comes in, in on an in network claim, okay, so you're a TPA, I'm going to pick on you again, sorry, Ed. you're the TPA. You get a good discount. You got a 20% discount on a $100,000 bill. You pay 80%, the stop loss spec is 50, you're expecting a check for 30,000. Your stop loss contract doesn't say anything about doing it any other way. What we're starting to see, folks, is stop loss carriers not reimbursing that 30,000. What they're starting to say is this. Under an advanced funding mechanism, where it's advanced funding, they're arguing that they're not subject to the PPO agreement. And because, which is, a, everyone here is like, wow, that's great. That means we can pay a better rate on the claim if it goes to stop loss. Well, what's the problem with that? Now, if that's true, the plan is not really self-insured, are they? Because the plan is not paying the claim with their own money. The plan has insurance through, let's pick on HCC, they were speaking earlier, right? Jay was here. <laughs> HCC Life is saying, we're advancing the funding. We're just going to pay that claim on behalf of the plan for 50000 total because that's what the UNC rate is. And I hear this from people, and they're like ecstatic about it. This is great. And from a standpoint of keeping the cost down, yes, it does sound great. It makes a lot of sense. But what's the problem with that, folks? The problem is right now we have a lot of case law, 11th Circuit, 4th Circuit, 8th Circuit, that says by you purchasing stop-loss coverage, the plan purchasing stop loss co coverage does not defeat the plan. It allows the plan to still be a self-insured plan. Because who's ultimately responsible for the payment of that claim? The plan is. And all they're doing is getting money back from another party later on. The actual plan member has no idea who the stop loss carrier even is. But what's happening now is we're starting to see a switch. And now we're seeing stop loss carriers say, we're advanced funding this claim, we're gonna pay this claim based on usual and customary and reasonable, blah, 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 we're paying $50,000. My fear is if we continue to do that or you see that happening, it's gonna make it an insured plan, no more self-funded rights, no more risk of preemption, state law mandates apply to you, all the same state law mandates that we have in Massachusetts, all 56 of them, are gonna to apply to this self-insured plan now because they have advanced funding for stop loss. That's the concern. So it's just something that's starting to happen now. Just be on the lookout. So if anybody here, honestly, I'm not even saying this from a trying to get your business or anything. If you have a situation where you see something like that happen, 
pick up the phone and call me or send me an email because these are the kind of things I want to watch for to make sure that we don't lose that one thing that we have as, and what that is is the fact that we're a risk of preemptive. All right, never events. I talk about this all the time. Folks, you have to look out for never events. Do not put wording in your plan doc that says that you're not going to pay on a never event. Don't put the word never event in your plan document. All it's doing, it gives the carrier a reason not to reimburse you. Because you can argue that anything is a never event. Anytime someone goes in for surgery and there's an infection, they can argue that infection never should have happened. A never event. We're not going to reimburse you on it. So what you got to do is a little different. And the wording, I'm going to go over in a minute. But make sure that if you're not identifying or looking for never events in your claims data now, do it when you go back to work. Start looking for it. My company's been doing it now for a period of three years once we heard of the whole HCC, actually two years, once we heard of the HCC class, that big famous memo they did, remember? September of 2008 was that big memo. We're not reimbursing on never events. Da -da -da. Okay, you know, everyone happy. <laughs> Scary day, everyone freaked out. Oh, what are we gonna do? SPBA was freaking out. Well, there's a lot you can do. One thing you gotta do is identify those particular claims. And two, have language in your plan doc that allows you to get that money back from the provider and or hospital if in the, if in the situation uh, occurs that you actually did pay on one of those claims. Usually a customer, I love this. My doctor told me to avoid any unnecessary stress, so I didn't open his bill. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Usual and customary. I could talk about this for eight hours. I'm gonna do a usual and customary webinar, a se um, seminar, like in Maui, like a couple of days. They like go on the beach, like no, no conference rooms. But what scares me is the first one, folks. All right? And please look at your plan docs when you go back, look at your template or look at whatever you can, take your biggest plan, read the language. Plans often only limit UNC to charges billed by similar providers for similar services in a similar locale and fail, fail to define the area. Folks, I have a hospital right now in New Jersey that has been coming after me, I don't even know how long. It's like I want to hire the situation from the Jersey Shore, you know the guy? <laughs> I want to hire him just to go to this hospital in Jersey and have a talk with him, like, hey, you see this? Don't overcharge these guys on, the, on these bills. That's what, I want, that's what I want this guy to do. I guess no one laughs because no one watches the show. Huh? <laughs> My wife makes me watch it. All right, how's, how's, how's that? But anyways, this hospital actually says in their letter, not a form, this isn't like some custom letter they made, it's a form letter. Their form letter says the following. We expect payment of 100% of bill charges, here's our charges, and here's why. We're the only hospital in our zip code. This isn't like some like, we'll try it, you know, hopefully they'll go for it. This is their template, folks. They write this letter to every single person that goes to their facility. Every member gets balance billed. They get sued. This is what's going on. And they argue that they are, their usual and customary rate is okay because they're the only hospital in their zip code. It's laughable. But what? I look at the plan doc. Well, they're the only provider in their zip code. Who's defining what the area is? You gotta make sure you define it by more than just that. Don't look at UNC only that way. Another thing I wanna talk about, what you have to do, offer multiple parameters. The lesser of, we're gonna reimburse you the lesser of these following levels. I'm not gonna get into all of them, I'd be giving away my livelihood if I did that. But think, you can think of these things yourself or contact my office. But these are the kind of things that you have to start doing in order to be innovative. In order to, you know, people say, well, Adam, you know, what do we do if they still balance bill? They're still going to balance bill. I'm not arguing that they're not going to balance bill you. Let's just get, let's get that clear. I want to make sure that people aren't thinking, oh, we do these things, they're not going to balance bills anymore. No, they will balance bill you, probably more than ever. Why? Because you're not paying them as much. You have to teach them. But if you don't put this language in your plan docs, you don't have the weaponry. You don't have an arsenal to fight back. Eight out of 10 times that I'm hired or brought in to the situation, I sit in my office with my attorneys and I say, how can they have this language in this plan? Eight out of 10 times, maybe nine out of 10. The once in a while, when I get that beautiful plan doc, that's like shining gold, you know, like I'm like, wow, I'm like I'm so excited. We win on those. 